Hi, Teal. How Hello. are you? I'm good. My name is Charlie Hogenberg. I'm doing an interview for Paravisi. It's like a Dutch spiritual magazine. Mm -hmm. And we're here today with Teal Swan. She's a very famous, well-known <laughs> spiritual teacher and writer. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were hosting a, a workshop yesterday in Amsterdam. Yes. The conservatorium. What was it like? I mean, I really liked that venue. It was pretty fun to have people up above as well as down below. I sort of liked the intensity of, of that. Yeah. Yeah, I found the audience to be um, not as engaged as my normal audiences. Yeah. I find that when I come to this area of the globe, it's um, people tend to be really polite. Mm. And so instead of being it being a juicy interview or a, a, you know one of those things where people put their energy forward is the kind of thing where people are very yeah, reserved. Yeah, a bit reserved. So That's it's real hard to suck energy out of the audience. You know? Oh yeah, but. yeah, I can imagine. I I've been watching a lot of your workshops like online, the ones that are on YouTube and stuff, and I, I felt it was a bit different than normal. Yeah. I don't know if it's just the ten no. like lately this is happening, or just with the Dutch, or maybe the German, or. It's with the know. Dutch and the Germans. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you, like, what? How do you uh, perceive the Dutch energy or the people or just? It's very mental. Yeah. I I feel like the, the Dutch people have a very hard time being in the heart space and in the emotions. There's very little that's messy about it. Yeah. And I, I have to be honest. I actually enjoy cultures that are emotionally messy. You know, the ones that's called Latin cultures, for example. Yeah. They tend to be. Uh, less logical but it, there's almost a gravity to their being and I really love that feeling so it can get a bit intimidating for somebody who's teaching the kind of subjects that I am to try to get somebody to intellectualize the heart which you kind yeah. of have to do you have to give give the Dutch a link between what they're thinking and their logical processes and their emotions and finding that link is quite difficult because it's like speaking a foreign language yeah so um, I find myself going in over people's heads often. I mean, it's a, it's a standard issue that a lot of spiritual teachers have. We're used to teaching people who have dedicated their entire life to this. And so when you, when you start off and you find out that somebody's at kindergarten level of, of tuning into their emotions, kindergarten level of understanding spirituality, then the whole entire discourse has to change. Yeah. So it's definitely challenging. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. You first got to teach people sort of how to feel yeah. and then from, take it from there. Yeah. But you have a really good new book about this, right? The completion process. Yeah. And <laughs> it's basically about, you know, how to deal with your emotions, feel them, you know, heal trauma yeah. and patterns and repeating issues. Yes. So this would be a good book for all the Dutch uh, viewers. <laughs> yeah, it really would be. I, I feel like if, if Dutch people can learn that there's nothing negative or inherently bad about their own emotional yeah. selves, then they would have a lot of, let's say, key to living. Yeah. Because what I, I mean, there's, this place is not a miserable place, right? There are places on the planet where you enter, like uh, Germany is one of them, I'm just going to be honest. Germany is one of the most miserable places I've been. Yeah. I mean, it, it tops Africa. Really? Oh, by far. But maybe it was because you were in Berlin, like Berlin. Everywhere. Yeah? Yeah. So like, I get called out of body to Germany more than yeah, anywhere else yeah. in the world. Oh. So and when we're looking at genuine misery, so I'm going to define genuine misery different than most people. Most people are going to define misery as I'm starving to death or, mm. my, you know. But the thing that you see in a lot of these countries where they've got those types of issues is there's still togetherness. Yeah. So the places where you find the most misery is the places where you find the most separation between people. Yeah. That difficulty and connection. Germany tops the list. Wow. So if you were to take a snapshot on an energetic level of the world and where people are the most unhappy, Germany is very top. And so it's not like when you come to areas where you've got the Dutch demographic that it's that, that same level of misery, mm. emotional misery that contained just torture. But it is still that sort of reservedness. And yeah. you drive around the streets and you watch people just really, they're seeking. Right, so they're not actually stuck as most people. Life is comfortable enough for the Dutch that they are actually asking questions and things like that. But all of the attention is external. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yeah. I think we're sort of doing okay as Dutch people, like practically and business-wise. Oh, yeah. Everything's going pretty fine, but we keep it all inside. And I feel lately there's a 
like everywhere there's a bit of a flow going on that people are more interested in how, what are you feeling like you know what are your emotions how do we become happy what can we do that's good but that yeah, we're good. still a long way from we're very contained very you know? contained if you go out like to a club in holland <laughs> like some people dance of course but usually either drunk or on drugs yeah. so like you know the sober dutchman mm -hmm. is not very you know free yeah. i guess i wish that was more the case more unconditional authentic yes i would like that too yeah same <laughs> for the whole world you know yeah so would you say that um the the core issue or the reason for most physical illness mental illness is like undealt with emotions 100 percent. so right. your advice for people who are like dealing with the sickness or who are really unhappy would be you have to tune into these emotional traumas that have happened yeah now if you're looking at that and you can generalize for different areas of the globe so just to help you out i'm going to generalize yeah. People who are growing up in the Dutch culture, they're suffering from what we call um, emotional neglect. Mm, yeah. So it's not about what did happen. When yeah. most Dutch people look back in their childhood, they're not going to find some horrible trauma like a genocide or like, you know, mom left me or dad left me. What they're going to find is it's what wasn't there. So um, this is why emotional neglect is so difficult if you want to know the honest truth. It's because when you look, it's not going to show up in pictures. It's the hugs that weren't there. It's the encouragement that wasn't given. It was the emotional intimacy that wasn't present between yeah. parents and children. It's that type of stuff that they don't even know that they needed, yeah. and yet they needed. That's going to be the kind of trauma. So it's that absence mm -hmm. of emotional connection that is going to be the reason for the majority of the illnesses that you find here. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I yeah, I know what you mean exactly. <laughs> But this is this is sort of echoing in the because yeah, I had the of course opportunity to be down downtown where you find um, a lot less tourists and a lot more people who are actually yeah. Dutch, right? Yeah. Which was super exciting, but I was watching them like I like to do in these cities, mm. and I was noticing that there's this collective feeling of something's really wrong with me. Oh, really? In Holland as well? Yeah. But I mean, nobody expresses it to each other. No. It's literally just like. Yeah. You know, it's like this internal sort of implosion of insecurity. And that happens because they can't link the way that they feel to a direct experience. That's the, the yeah. symptom of emotional neglect. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's it's like the, the people of... I think I would have to take people in this area of the globe over to somewhere like Brazil, a very warm type of culture, to have them experience what it is that they were missing in their relationships here. Yeah. To have them walk in the door and have mom and dad be like, hey, how'd you do at school today? And then walk upstairs for them to feel that, that space between people. Yeah. 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 yeah, that could be good. I think it would be good, good therapy. Just mix all kinds of people from oh. all countries and oh my gosh. have them teach each other. It'd be know, wonderful. Heal each other. That'd be really great. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, and I was wondering, because I'm really always interested in like natural cures and stuff, okay. because of course I know, <clears throat> I, I sort of do the same work as you do, I have my own practice as well, besides this work, and I understand that, you know, you, you always have to look at the, the underlying emotion or w the pattern, like what's creating this illness, but also I'm very interested in natural cures and stuff. Yeah. Do you know any, like, do you have any recommendations? Good, <clears throat> some good book about this or websites or That's what would you, It's like I'm, I'm missing some sort of great database for this. Like if viewers at home would like to find a natural cure instead of their chemical medication, you know? <laughs> do you have any? I, yeah, I am totally not connected in that way. That's oh no, I thought you like once said something about like for headaches, you use like a, the, the frequency of, what is it called, bark or, no, a tree? Oh, Aspen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's information coming from me, and I oh. haven't written that book yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you could write a book about that. Yeah, I probably should. Yeah. But I've also, <clears throat> I've dropped a lot of my physical remedies. I mean, I'm an advocate of using um, physical healing modalities on top of mental healing modalities, on top of emotional healing modalities, all of them at once. I love integrative healing. But... I dropped a lot of, of my work involving remedies and things like that yeah. because of the fact that if you don't address the root, yeah, of course. and when you do address the root, what do we find? You don't need it anymore. No, that's true. 
That's true. So most of my work, I mean, probably 99% at this point, is getting to the emotional root. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a good, you did the interview with the, is that? Uh, yeah, about yeah. Yeah. That's a good book as well, I think, about mm -hmm. this. If people would like more guideline for this, you know, because I always ask people to, to try to feel themselves, like, you know, this this issue, what, is it, what does it feel like to you? How does it make you feel? Yeah. What is it doing for you? You know, because there's always a hidden benefit as well. So, but yeah. I did a video that I released yesterday, actually. Oh, really? It's super ironic because we're having this, yeah. this interview right now. Yesterday I released a video that, um, it details a meditation that you can do, which is more than a meditation. It's basically an inner journey work. Yeah process but it details how if you've got any kind of issue an ailment or anything how you can go inside and actually communicate with that illness directly so that you can figure out why it's there yeah it offers the best opportunity for resolution as far as I'm concerned so, yeah that's good so that would be is a it a uh, steel video or yeah, yeah it's called meditation for self-awareness okay that's great you definitely going to check that out but if I mean I I'm always an advocate of people directly talking to themselves instead of having to go to an outside resource for yeah, what they need course. or whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, b but if people are in a place where they really just feel completely blocked yeah. in terms of that, um, Yvette Rose did a book that I think it's called Metaphysical Anatomy. Yeah. Metaphysical, yeah. yeah. I really like that book for, yeah. for people who just want a suggestion about, okay, if I have something like um, HIV, why might that emotionally be occurring in my life. It's a it's a good starter book for yeah suggesting why there might be yeah, a specific just condition. Just a little direction of you know yeah. yeah it's pretty a lot of it was really correct. Like I checked a lot of stuff of course. <laughs> oh it's such a big book as well. I was like how did you find the time to read to write all this, you know, where did you get it from? It was like yeah, it's great. So um yeah. Um I was. I have a few other questions, just random questions that I would like to ask you, just because I respect your point of view okay. and your, you know, the, all the knowledge you have. So, people talk about awakening a lot, huh? and and I feel like for to a lot of people it means a different sort of thing. Like everybody has their own, I don't know, idea about this. So how do you, if you would have to describe it to people who are not so familiar with all this spiritual, you know stuff what what are you, what do you awaken to <laughs> or is this like really abstract question no it's not an abstract question you awaken to everything but here's what we have to understand a human embodiment because of the way that we're socialized is basically split into two hmm. you've got the conscious and the subconscious yeah now we can explain this very easily you ready so what's something that you know that you can do like a skill or hmm? Um, horse riding? Okay, so you know that you know that. Yeah. What's something you know you don't know? Um, well, I don't know, uh, play tennis? <laughs> okay, so you know that you don't know how to play tennis. Yeah. That's still consciousness. Yeah. Because you're still, still aware. aware of those yeah. things. When we're dealing with the subconscious mind, what we're dealing with is what we don't know that we don't know. So you may not know that you don't know what's going on in the center of the earth. Yeah. And I may know you don't know it. Yeah. But you don't know it. Yeah. That's what the subconscious is all about. So that's why it's super, super difficult for people to kind of conceptualize of it because the subconscious is what you don't know that you don't know. Yeah. So awakening is becoming aware of all of that. Mm hmm So your own subconscious? Every, or? The subconscious of everything. So this, yeah. we have to understand that we're a mirror. So. Yeah. We have a subconscious and a conscious. So does the world. Yeah. So does the human race. Yeah. So does the universe at large. So awakening is the process of first starting to, I mean, it doesn't, it's not like it happens in steps because it'll go back and forth. Yeah. The more you reveal about yourself, the more that there's revealed about the universe. So you're never going to be stop, stopping to figure out about yourself and then now figuring out about the universe. It's not... Uh, divisible like that. Yeah. But it usually begins with people starting to figure out things they didn't know about themselves. Like for example, a woman may be like, okay, I've been ignoring my emotions for my entire life. And right now for the first time I am aware that I'm not happy. Mm. That's awakening. She's yeah. awakening to the fact that she's not happy. Yeah. Now, if she does further exploration into why she's unhappy, she will discover something else she doesn't know she didn't know. 
Yeah. Right? So the process of awakening is just continuing on that path more and more and more and more. So what you find is you're, you're starting to see from these different perspectives. Like awakening involves so many things. It's, just, it's yeah. like there's no way that I could encapsulate it. Nobody can encapsulate it into one no. tiny little nugget and hand it to you and say that's what it is. But you start to take on all of these perspectives. And ultimately when we're talking about enlightenment, we're talking about taking on the perspective of source at large. That is definitely what we didn't know we didn't know. So. <laughs> no. <laughs> so no, I know what you mean. That would be my definition. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I understand what you mean. And like, it practically, it would also sort of mean for people, they be become really aware about what's going on in society and politics and about food, mm -hmm. you know, all that stuff. Yes. And then, yeah, you just gain more awareness and knowledge and yes. sort of live more uh, in alignment, yes. which is my other question. Okay. Alignment is also a bit abstract oh God. sort of saying for people. Okay. What is alignment and being aligned to what? <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you don't have to apologize. It's just that this is, this, this, is, this is my challenge as a teacher to basically sum something that is very complicated up in a way where people who are very mentally based could understand this. Yeah. Okay, so I do have a belt or something. Somebody needs to find me something because this would be awesome. A belt. Oh, uh, I know what you're going to do. I know that one. Yeah. yeah. This, this is just the best way to explain <laughs> Ellen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so for the sake of people I'm wanting to understand the alignment, they have to understand that they are two points of perspective. Yeah. Let's call you my higher self, okay? So the higher self, this is the eternal being. It's not really an individual self, right? Yeah. Because the individual self is something that we conceptualize of when we come into physical embodiment. However, for the sake of this understanding, let's just pretend you are my higher self. Mm -hmm. I am what you have projected forward into the third dimension. Yeah. I am the temporal self. Because you projected me forward, we're connected, right? Yeah. So this stream of energy is coming from you into me, and now I am this embodiment. The best way to think about this is let's pretend we're in a computer game. Mm -hmm. The third dimension is like a computer game that the higher self projects an aspect of itself into so that it can experience the direct mirroring of itself. That's why this is the place to find awareness. Yeah. This is why this is the, the leading edge of expansion. So now there's this connection. Now, when I come into my physical perspective as a projection of you, I now have my own point of perspective. And with free, free will. will. Yes, exactly, I was going to say. <laughs> so I, by virtue of my focus, that dictates my vibration. Yeah. So you and I can vibrate at different frequencies. However, when we vibrate at different frequencies, the gap here gets wider. Yeah. Yeah. If we vibrate at a similar frequency, the gap here gets closer. Yeah. Now this is what your emotions are all about. Your negative emotion is an indication that in this moment, something you're thinking, focusing on doing, has got you vibrating Further away. farther away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we could say out of alignment. This is what we mean by out of alignment. Yeah, exactly. When I'm, when I'm vibrating at a frequency farther away from you, I'm vibrating out of alignment. I know that because I don't feel good. Yeah. When I start to feel better, feel better, feel better, that's an indication that my vibration is coming closer to yours. Yeah, yeah. That's in alignment. Okay. So if you're thinking something, saying something, doing something that's causing you to feel negative emotion, you're out of alignment. Yeah. You're that's not doing what feels yeah. good to you. So, so, so when we say out of alignment, it means I'm doing something, saying something, feeling something, you know, whatever that, that's got me not feeling good. And what that means on a spiritual level is. Yeah. That. Yeah. That's all. Okay, well, thanks for this. <laughs> but, but here's what people have to understand. This is why alignment's important, ready? Yeah. I know, I just went back from like, Wait. It's okay. <laughs> okay. We can do more. <clears throat> the reason that, that in alignment versus out of alignment really matters more so than just feeling good is because when you start to vibrate out of alignment, they ne feel negatively. Yeah. This is where I manifest cancer. This yeah. is where I get in a car wreck. This is where I get into breakups. The, all that stuff that's yeah. really not, you know, not a feel-good reflection. Yeah. So vibrating in alignment, this is where I get the job I wanted, I have the relationship coming into my life that feels good to me and all that stuff. Yeah. So w the reason that we talk about being in alignment is because in general, what we want in this time-space reality is to experience those types of experiences yeah. instead of these. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I get it. Okay, so basically for people um, 
people at home, they just, you know, they want to be more in alignment. Your best tip would be follow what feels good to you. Yeah. Yeah. You have to become so intimately aware with your own emotions that you know what each one of them means to begin with. Like we said, it seems abstract because you have been trained to ignore your emotion. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, especially in a mental country. Yeah. So if you've been trained to ignore your emotions, then you've lost your guidance system for how to vibrate closer or more distant from your eternal yeah. self. So to begin with, you're like, well, I don't know how I feel. Hmm. And you might feel a crushing in your chest and only when something serious happens. Yeah. So you begin by becoming familiar with that. After that, it will become more and more obvious. So the best way to describe it is, I know you guys are skaters, so I'm just gonna use the skating reference. Like ice skating? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so when you first start out ice skating, you just cannot figure out why you can't stand up. Mm. Like you can't, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel obvious to you. As you keep going and as you keep skating, the subtle nuances of the ice, the way that your skate lands on the ice, everything, you start to feel the subtleties to such an extreme degree. That like if you were to talk to a beginner and be like, you're not on your outside edge. Yeah. The beginner would be like, what do you mean? What does that mean? <laughs> But to you, it's like obvious when you're on your outside edge. Yeah. So it's like that. The more familiar you start to get with your emotions, the more you feel your outside edge. Mm. And, you're, and it becomes a very obvious. And you're like, oh my gosh, wow. I can feel that subtle, what would be a subtle difference to someone else, feels like a big difference to me between this type of jealousy and that type of jealousy and what that means I'm thinking and why am I thinking that? So it actually becomes your way of opening up your mind to the awareness that is necessary for you to actually make big shifts, to make big changes, to choose what's right for you. Yeah. As opposed to just stay stuck in a life that's oh, sort of... Uh, that's such a big problem yeah. right now, <laughs> especially here. People are really trained to be good workers, you know, to be the good wife, to be the good friend. <laughs> it's like it's so clean slate, everything, and you know, yep. follow what feels good to you. It's like everyone's biggest fear and nightmare, but in the end it's what we crave as well. I th I just, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah but this... you talked about it yesterday in the workshop as well. It's like people always think, if I just do what feels good, I'm never going to clean my house or I'll never <laughs> go to work, you know? Oh, Why God, care? Man. Yeah. But yeah, you will get over that point, you, you know? You probably won't clean your house for two weeks, but then you get so sick of it, like you said. You know, it can't last forever. Yes. Yeah. It's the hardest thing to come into cultures like this and to explain that your life isn't gonna completely fall apart by yeah. virtue of doing what feels good. <laughs> but I mean, that this place needs emotional messiness is what it needs. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> How do we do that? Like, what can we do? Do you have any? I feel like it starts with it starts with us being willing to do it, and then by virtue of our influence, people start to yeah, do it. Yeah, that's true. If I walked into the average, I mean, this is what's super fun. In the future, I really want to do this reality show where they like parachute me into houses, and I just sort of wreak havoc on a wow. in a good way on people's lives. But I mean, I, you could imagine me sort of parachuting into the average Dutch household, me being like, "All right, so I don't feel like doing this, so let's not do it today." <laughs> What? <laughs> yeah, but like just by virtue of me being around, you know, or people like us yeah. being around that, it actually, it'll make it so that the next moment when somebody really has that choice to make, mm. am I going to do what I really don't want to do or am I going to follow what emotionally feels good right now, they're going to get really sick of making this choice. And so eventually they're going to be like, oh my God, you know what, whatever. Yeah. Let's like, let's just prioritize things that matter more. Yeah. 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 So relationships would improve. We wouldn't be trying to uh, impress other people so much. It wouldn't be so structured. Hmm. I know it's like a prison, like a harness you're in. It's like so unfree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, for I think so. It's gonna happen. Like slowly, people, you know, they they just cannot and can, can't do it anymore. Starting with work, I feel like that for the most people, that's the thing that you know. I feel in Holland as well, uh, you know, my friends or people I know are all like, I just, I just cannot afford it anymore to do a job that I really don't like. That's like a nice way to say it. <laughs> but yeah, so that's where they start. And then, you know, of course, there's all these questions. How am I going to survive? What a, who's going to pay for my house if I do my passion, follow my joy? But yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, I'm always very, um, I don't know, pretty straightforward kind of person you mm -hmm. know like honest open and because i am other people are always like when they're around me they're like wow this is like such a relief you know so it's true if you you know 
set the example, people will follow and yep. you sort of teach them that it's okay to be that way. And mm -hmm. it feels better actually. So, yeah. People also need to understand that they don't have to jump ship immediately. It's not like they have to quit their job today and then instantaneously yeah. be doing something full time that they love. What I want to suggest is that instead of spending their time, their excess time doing X, Y, and Z, they start filling that space up with what they actually want to do and it creates a, a kind of a stepping stone. Yeah. So eventually they're going to have to choose between them, but at least they will have built this up a little bit. That I think in this country that would be a way better idea for yes, most people. Yes, exactly. But we, on the other hand, we're pretty like, um, I don't know, black and white in a way. It's like, okay, so now I'm doing everything according to what's expected of me. Mm -hmm. And then they get this idea, maybe I want to do, you know, the teal thing and follow what feels good. So then the Dutch people can also be like this, like, okay, that tomorrow I will change everything. <laughs> So I like, love that personality type, but it's risky. I know it really is. This is. Can I explain why it's risky yeah. to you? If you jump ship immediately without cleaning up the vibration in a gradual way, then you haven't really set yourself up for success. You've set yourself yeah. up for failure. So let's say that I have a belief um, about my job. I hate my job, except for I need my job to pay the bills. So the belief is there that I can't make money doing something else. Yeah. Let's pretend that I quit my job today without ever helping myself to change that way of thinking. Because that vibration is still within me, I would most likely experience making no money. Yeah. And then I'd eventually have to quit doing what I really love doing, go back to what I hated, and then I'd say, yeah. see, that's proof. It doesn't work. Yeah. So that's why I think it's very dangerous. So what's a better idea is, is to gradually be st stepping into that other space. You start to, by virtue of doing that, you start to work on the, that vibration, that energy. You start, the minute you start to see some money coming in as a result of that other thing, yeah. you can't hold that same belief with as much solidarity. So when you eventually have to make that jump, it's not onto this very shaky basis of, I'm not gonna be able to make money doing it. Yeah. So, I would, I would much rather that than people be, let's say, proving things that I really don't think they should be proving to themselves. No, no. Because then they get so disappointed and then the, the damage is actually bigger, maybe. Oh, it's much bigger. And then it, it's yeah. ten times. The minute you have more proof, more proof and more proof and more proof, yeah. it's harder to change the belief. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's, it's kind of like a beetle that like bores into the skin. It just gets deeper yeah. and deeper and deeper. So. For someone like me, what we're just trying to do is back it up, back it up, yeah. back it up so it comes out. And obviously if people take those kinds of risks and get into a situation where it bores even deeper, it gets much more difficult to back out. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I well, mean, we all know that with our deepest beliefs. These beliefs which we've been vibrating for since we were five, six, seven. Yeah. By the time we're in our thirties, it's like, yeah, you don't know how much proof I have for that. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> so. So for that, like, what is it called? Cognitive behavioral therapy? I feel sometimes this could be for a mental country or mm -hmm. people like Hol in Holland. This could sort of work, you know, you could, ch you know, challenge your own beliefs. Like you have a video on this as well. Like, you know, try to find proof for that it could also be. Yeah, I love, I love challenging your beliefs. I think yeah. it's a wonderful idea, but I also think it, it doesn't 100% work, especially on vibrations that have been going on since before you were age eight. Yeah. Do you want to know why? Okay, so before you were age eight, <laughs> your mental capacity is not actually there. You are not thinking about the world, you are feeling the world, you are a completely felt perception based being. And so what we have to understand is that these, these beliefs are getting embedded into the somatic aspect of our being. Yeah. It is not in the mind. Yeah. So what we find is when we're, when we're pulling up those deepest beliefs, they're the result of traumas that were experienced prior to that age and you cannot access them through cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. So the actual kind of therapy, which I would be suggesting to people the most if they want to work on the deepest anchors of their being is somatic therapy. It's, yeah. it's the trauma that's stored in the body, the soma. That is where we need to be for that. Yeah, I looked into that the other day, but I feel like in Holland it's not as well known. Do you surprise? Is that surprising to you? No, of course not. <laughs> but, yeah. It could, yeah. Well, it's not as well. It's not as known around the world because okay. most yeah. people are like, "What do you mean? I've got memory in my body." That's an abstract yeah. concept to most people because they don't understand the way that a cell works and the way that your yeah. nervous system works. But um, it's the way to go, and it is going to be the wave of the future, I think, as far as um, psychotherapy. In fact, I'm I'm going to predict 
yeah. that the way that we see, I mean, mainstream psychology, I think, I think it's going to go in the direction of somatic therapy. Yeah, well, I always felt like they try to do a good job, and in some <coughs> ways they are doing a good job, but there's really a big gaping hole because there's no room for emotion or feelings. Well, never. Never has anyone asked me, you know, I've been in therapy, never do they ask me, like, how do you feel? Yeah, and you why don't do you feel want like to get me started on therapy, because <laughs> no, it's like, a, it is like the, another bane of my existence. But um, yeah. in their defense, it is an entire industry that is set up to make you feel good. Yeah. So if yeah. You, it's like, it's almost like going up to somebody, let's say that somebody has a business in curing diabetes and being like, why don't you ask me how my diabetes is doing? It needs some validation. Yeah, okay, I get it, but yeah. They, it needs to change. They need to change that completely. Yeah. So if they change that, they can't, they can't any longer say, come here to feel better. No. But, but um, yeah, I think they're really afraid. Of course they are. Of Most, they're afraid oh my God, if I could, freak out. I wish I could cross-section the average therapist for you. <laughs> this is a person who is so terrified of the way they feel, trying so desperately mm. to get away from how they feel, that they've made a life study of it. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, you're not going to be able to walk into a psychotherapy office, the average psychotherapy office, and be like, guess what? These emotions actually should be honored and acknowledged and yeah. stay there instead of Abilify or Zoloft. Or, yeah. Well, luckily in Holland, it's probably not as bad as in your country with all the medication. Oh, they, it's going that way, but hopefully we can stop this or change it. But yeah, yeah. it's like... Yeah. I cannot even imagine what it would be like, you know, all these advertisements on TV and stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah. Could cause death, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's definitely not the way to go. But mm -hmm. luckily, we have your new book now, so people <laughs> even can tr do it at home. They can at least mm -hmm. get familiar with the concept of yes. it. They can read it and, you know, try some minor issues that they might have. Yes. And you're um, teaching a lot of new practitioners as well, so... Yeah. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to create a process that people wouldn't need to rely on other people for. Yeah. Now, in countries like this, let's just be honest, every, pretty much everywhere else has much better um, access to, let's say, healing modalities than Americans. We have such bad health care, it is literally ridiculous. Oh. And it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. I mean, I'm on the best insurance. It didn't used to be insurable in my own country. Now I have, I have the cheapest insurance that you can find. It's supposed to be the best, most coverage. I had a surgery, and it's going to cost me about 10 grand. Wow. And that is literally, that's minimal. It used to be, I mean, Blake, the man who works with me, right? Most people know Blake from my workshops and from yeah. my videos. He actually is completely bankrupt based on the fact that his lung spontaneously collapsed. That was an $80,000 bill. You're not going to pay that. So basically, a lot. Of, I mean, America is a mess. So yeah. the reality is that it's a, it's a luxury to get any kind of health care. And yeah. so the same goes for mental therapy. Yeah, of course. The people who can afford therapy in these places in the world are people who are wealthy. Yeah. So... When you look at trauma, the majority of the people who have experienced yeah. high degrees of trauma, are they like rolling in dough? No, they're really no. struggling still. So I wanted to create a process that people wouldn't need anybody to help them with. Yeah. And I managed to do that. On the side, I have facilitators because one of the most key aspects of healing in any kind of therapy is that secure connection. That's part of what is healing. Mm. So I wanted to have people who were trained to facilitate the process that could offer that to people if they wanted it, but it isn't necessary. So I could at least create a safety net for those that could not afford that. Yeah. So I've managed to do it, which yeah. makes me really super excited. But I would really love to live in a world where uh, psychotherapy is not a luxury. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, I really wish I could also convince the governments of the world that that is going to really save their budget because what they're looking at when they're looking at all the diabetics that are flooding their system, yeah. the people who are dying, um, aging really, really poorly, the people who have got chronic illnesses, cancers, for God's sake, you could prevent that if you could just put a lot more of your energy into providing opportunities for people that are free where they could get access to this kind of emotional and mental based healing. I mean, it would just be fun if one country was brave enough to just try it for two years, that's it. 
two years of making that available to the general demographic to see what that did on the back end of physical ailments yeah. and the amount that the state's paying for that. I think maybe one of the Nordic countries would probably be. Probably. They're it's definitely going to be Europe. So good. Right? Like, they have all these. I, what the country was it? Like, Norway? They said, like, you cannot chop any more trees because they have, are sentient beings or something. I don't know. In my heart, exactly. I was like, thank you, God. Yes. I, I honestly, I mean, this is part of why I love Europe so much. I think that the, the first country that's going to really be on the wave of these types of changes is definitely going to be a European mm. country. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so a whole different question. <laughs> parenting. Okay. You have a video about parenting. I think it's one of your older ones, but it's still pretty good, yeah. you know, and, and lots of information. But I was wondering, like, when are you, are you planning on writing a book mm -hmm. about this? Of course I am. Because I really need this book. If I ever become a parent, I need it. <laughs> In alignment parenting. Yes, I'm going to write that book. Yeah. Okay. It's inevitable. So it's soon, or well, like it's inside know. you somewhere. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. that's the thing. I feel like I have like this lineup of books yeah. that are just in me, waiting to come out, and then seminars attached to that, and and all this stuff. And it, it's sort of like you can think of all the projects in me as as like. Have you ever seen how the, a chicken is from the cross section of the inside? You've got all these little eggs that are developing into the bigger eggs that come out tomorrow. No, but I can imagine. Well, it's weird. It's literally like the, if the inside of a chicken is like a little factory. So you've got the, these tiny little eggs, and they grow bigger and bigger and bigger until the one that's about to come out tomorrow, basically. Wow. And that's what it looks like. Yeah. So that's kind of what I feel like is happening with the need. <laughs> so I know that these projects are there 100%. I know it's inevitable because the reality is let's look at what I'm teaching. Most of what we talk about in this field, because it's right, whether you're in therapy with a psychotherapist or whether you're talking to a spiritual teacher, is you're this way because of your childhood. No surprise, right? Yeah. So obviously we have to, that's where to go. Yeah. If you really want to change the way that society progresses, you attack childhood. So I'm going to have to write that parenting book and I'm jazzed about it. It's just that what will happen is that the next project that comes up will be this certain project and then it kind of unfolds in that way. Yeah. But you're a really fast writer, right? You wrote the completion process in what, two months or something? Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> Like, I, yeah, I bow to that, like dedication and work <laughs> effort. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So um, if you would have to describe like in sh brief for people at home, in alignment parenting, or how would you call it? Like, what do you, parenting the new way. <laughs> parenting the new way. <coughs> These children are not your children. That's the first step. We have got to stop seeing them as ours. You may have been entrusted with this child, but this child belongs to the universe. Mm -hmm. This child has a soul stream which is old, if not older than your own. Yeah, probably. This child knows why this child came to earth. Your job is to unfold this child, not to dictate what this child is. For thousands of years, we have addressed children as if it's a ball of clay that we somehow have to mold yeah. into what we want to see. So we, we as parents say, you know what, I want this child to be successful and to fit in the world because I've decided that's a high value. Yeah. So I'm going to do whatever it takes to get them to be inside that mold. It's a totally opposite approach from being gifted something that you don't know what's inside. Because you don't. When this child is born, you have no clue what its purpose is. You have no clue about who this person's genuine personality is. And your job is basically to facilitate the opening of that. So you do that by introducing the ingredients that allow it to unfold. It's more like helping a flower to bloom. If you want a flower to bloom, you know that you have to water it in a certain way. You know that you have to feed it in a certain way. You know you have to expose it to certain conditions. And from there, it naturally unfolds. So it's that process that we mm -hmm. have to become super adept to as parents. And besides that, the number one tip that I could give people is that you have to have high degrees of emotional intimacy with your children. Yeah. You need to see into them, feel into them, understand them completely. And we have terrible capacity to do that because we don't do it with ourselves even. Yeah. But I mean, really, you, you, the level of closeness you have to develop with the internal world of a child is incredible. Yeah. But when you do that, and when you mirror to them what's inside themselves, I can't even tell you the type of people that this creates. It's like you haven't seen a child like that. No. I was just thinking about this. Like, 
probably the, these crystal children that oh, are yeah. all coming in now, they, they usually get born with indigo parents, right? Yes. So I'm really excited to see what they will become. Like They are the most abnormal children you'll ever meet. <laughs> yeah. I, I love them. They yeah. cannot be tamed. No. It is not possible. And I love that. It's like a disease, but a beneficial one across humanity. Yeah. Because these children, are they're not going to agree with the way that our society is currently run. And to them, unless you crush them into thinking that it has to be that way, with good luck with a crystal child with that, because they usually die. Oh, that's so they're incredibly sensitive. Yeah. And so if you start to try to apply the same pressure that is usually applied during the parenting and socialization phase to a crystal child, they start getting sick. They start developing issues, especially gastrointestinal issues, and oftentimes they, they die. So quite literally, like you cannot raise one that way. It has to be, I'm going to create an environment that is beneficial to the child themselves. And what you find is they have this kind of mind where when you say that a, way, a thing in society is a certain way, their answer is, why? I know, yeah. <laughs> and if you say, because it is, they say, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. So they cannot be corralled, which is amazing. I love that. Do you, are, are they like Indigo 2.0, <laughs> like even beyond? Yes. But I thought they were more sensitive. The indigos were more like the warrior types, mm -hmm. I guess. They yeah, they are like, more sensitive. No, I don't want to do this. Well, that's, do you want to live in a warrior's world? No, of course not. Me I neither. Know. We just so. paved the way and, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. We need, we need emotional sensitivity towards each other. Yeah. This world needs to be much much softer than it is. Yeah. All you need to do is to go through the airport security line to realize how damaging that is to the system, and that's the way that most society is. I mean, what, the average person, they get dressed, put on their shoes to go outside the door, and they're instantly in a space of tension. Yeah. It's like you gotta put your armor on to be in this world. Mm -hmm. The crystal children cannot do that. And so what will you see as a result of them coming into the world? There's literally two ways. Either they die because yeah. they, they're like jellyfish in this world. They cannot they coexist with this world or else the world changes to suit jellyfish. Now, it just so happens that if the world changes to suit the jellyfish, it suits everyone mm -hmm. because there are Geiger yeah. counter. You know how there's like a, a teller species? Mm. So like, uh, for example, scientists will look at a, an entire ecosystem and if the amphibians are not doing good, they know that the entire oh, ecosystem yeah, isn't doing good. Yeah, yeah. The crystal children are our teller species. Yeah, yeah, yeah they will tell you what's healthy for everyone. Yeah. So it's true that there might be more resiliency in a deer in an ecosystem than in an amphibian. But if the amphibian's sick, it's not good for the deer. Yeah, it's gonna spread. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Well, I do think there are some changes going on, especially in Holland as well, like in the way daycare is set up and you know, they sort of try to get it. <laughs> they don't really get it, but they try to accommodate them. So, yeah. So but what about in alignment parenting? It's like, if, if, let's say your child doesn't want to go to school. Mm -hmm. I know this is a question. This is the same kind of question that people ask, like, what, if, what happens if I just do what feels good? So if the child doesn't want to go to school, you just... We have a whole conversation about you know, bringing awareness to why we don't want to go to school. Yeah, yeah. We figure out whether we can change those, those aspects of why the child doesn't want to go to school. You roped the school into it. I mean, this is the reality. This is the most important place for the child because they're spending more time there than with you. Yeah. So if you're not the kind of parent who's willing to walk into the school and be like, look, we've got these specific issues and raising a conscious child, they will be able to tell you, I would love you to meet my son. Yeah. Because of the fact that he's been raised with emotional awareness, his EQ is so freaking high, it's insane. He'll tell you, I feel angry. I feel angry because of this. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's a question why they're not liking school, they'll tell you. Yeah. So if you can get that, then you walk into the school, you say, we've got issues with this. Is there any way we can work around this and work with it? Yeah. Because you've got to give any being the idea that they have the capacity to change what does not feel good. Yeah. It's a torment if you grow up with the idea that it doesn't matter whether you feel that way, it's how it is. Yeah. Couldn't think of a worse thing even for the expansion of society is why we're stuck. So basically, um, you walk into the school, you have them figure that out. If you're working with a school that is unwilling to do any of that, you better think about pulling your kid out. Yeah. You better think about an alternative, is what I have to say. And in the future, the schools that will be created are schools that already think about this. I mean, it's already happening. We're already getting schools that understand that, that child-initiated learning is the most important thing in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in that as a parent. I don't care if he learns about world geography and this kind of crap. What I care about is, is he a happy person? That's my definition of success. Yeah. So what should schools be teaching children, first and foremost, how to learn? 
Mm -hmm. Now that sounds funny. What do you mean teaching someone how to learn? Well, here's the thing. If you give them the skills to read, you teach them how to go seek knowledge when they feel the inspiration to seek knowledge. That is literally the tool you need to give them for their life. If they feel inspired towards learning music, they will then know how to go follow the path of learning and education. Mm -hmm. Way more important than what we feed them. Yeah. I mean, I mean, look at the world we live in today. We walk out of school with zero skills for relationships. And yet it's the most important part of life. So yeah. it's not about what we're feeding our children in terms of uh, education. It's about how we're teaching them to interact with the process of learning itself. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm really, before that, it's just going to be up to brave parents to either create that for their children or to do whatever it takes to find something that you know, currently exists mm. that accommodates for that type of child. But we're, we're too afraid of how other people think of us. I mean, I'm, I'll admit it, as a mom, it's, I go bright red. I'm like, God, I do not like conflict. I hate conflict. But, but the question is, is it a bigger priority for me to avoid conflict and to like fit in with the rest of society and these other moms and all the teachers and be liked by everybody? Or is it more important that this being who I am have taken responsibility for grows up in a way where he is unimpeded? Mm -hmm. So whenever that's the case, we have very serious conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And then also there's another thing too. If you run into a situation, let's just pretend you run into a situation where like you're absolutely stuck. You're stuck in a situation where you cannot afford to break out of the system and there's nothing available to you except for this crappy school that you've put your kid in. The worst thing you can ever tell your child is it's the way it is. End of story. You want to validate the way they feel completely understand the way they feel and then give them the empowered idea that in the future they can change it. Mm -hmm. So the few, very few times I've run into this with like a, you know, friends, children, for example, we have a conversation with a child that goes like this. Yeah, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to me either. I don't know what to do about it really. But you know, what's really awesome is that when you grow up, you can think of something to do differently. Maybe you can think of that right now. Mm -hmm. So that even opens a little bit of a window for even if I can't change it right now, it's a thing in progress. Yeah. Maybe I am part of that progress. Mm -hmm. So they don't feel like they're hitting a brick wall. Yeah, they're stuck forever. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the worst feeling. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a good what you say. Like, ask them why. Why don't you like it? You know? Because yeah. a lot of people are like either, either they're like, yeah, you have to go to school anyway. Or like, oh, you don't want to go? Then you don't have to go. But mm -hmm. there's like a middle. No, there is a middle ground. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times with children, it boils down to something which we would consider to be quite simple. It's, you know, I just, I don't like lunchtime for this reason. Yeah. So let's work on that. Yeah. Okay. I just, I just, it's so important. It is so important, especially from my perspective. You want to raise a person that's not going to be sitting in a therapist's office in their 20s wondering mm. why they're miserable cutting their arms or ad addicted. So like, as a parent, that'd be a good success, right? Yeah. So if you want that kind of person, you've got to raise them from moment one with the idea that they can change the circumstances they're experiencing. Why do you take drugs or something like that? Because you can't change anything. So at least if you, if you give them the impression that they have some capacity to alter the circumstances of their life in, in an empowered way so that it can feel a little bit better, whether it's bringing different foods to school or talking to the school about how they can create a, an atmosphere in the lunchroom that is more cohesive socially. Anything you can do like that gives a child this concept of empowerment, a concept of I do have control over the reality that I live. Mm -hmm. I'm not coming into a prison where, where it is how it is. Yeah. I hate that saying, by the way. So many people are like, it is what it is. When I hear that, I'm like, Jesus. Yeah. But that's the indigo thing, because I always had the same way. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, it is what it is. Why? Why? It doesn't have to be this way. So, yeah, I think this is in our DNA or something. It is. I actually saw the other day, I really loved this, because, like, whoever, I would love to meet the parents of this child. But basically, I saw, I saw that this kid who was in middle school had created an app. Mm. And it was an app that allowed people to find lunch tables to sit at. Cause oh, I saw that. I was like, this is exactly the kind of kids we need to start creating. Kids that feel yeah. like they actually can make a difference. Because how many of us in the you know, 70s, 80s, and 90s yeah. were like, we walk into the lunchroom and it's like, oh my yeah. God, I'm not, I have nowhere to sit. And if I try to sit by the popular kids, they're going to kick me out. And if yeah. I sit by myself over the table, I'm going to get beat up or like whatever <laughs> it is. So I just love it. It's the, and it's too, it's, it's horrible to be rejected. So you don't want to be like, can I sit here? No, screw that. I'd yeah. rather go sit by myself. So 
I mean, this app is amazing where kids can say, okay, I need a table to sit at, and then they can secretively create that type of a social atmosphere. It's like, yeah. genius. But it's that type of stuff that we need to be empowering kids to do that. Yeah. I, mean, I can guarantee you that she does not have parents. That kid does not have parents that are normal. Yeah. Because she wouldn't have even thought of it. Mm. I mean, why, why did we not think of something like that? I don't know, but I think it's in, in their DNA. They're very solution-oriented. Because of our wanting. Because, yeah, true. <laughs> like, that's also the kid who, who created this thing in the ocean, this, like, I don't know, some sort of system that catches all the plastic in the ocean. That was a kid who made that. <laughs> so, yeah, I bowed to that. I'm like, yes, you guys are going to help us out and save our world, you know? <laughs> We tried, as you know, our generation to sort of open stuff up, but they're they're going to skyrocket. Well, this is something that I wish that the human beings understood that each generation is an improvement upon the last. Yeah. Expansion is not just happening individually; it's happening in a in an entire collective species. That's what evolution is. Yeah, evolution is the expansion taking place through the collective consciousness of one species. So this is why the indigo children were born to the 1960s children. Yeah. 1960s, you, what do you have? You have all the desires for peace, all the mm. desires for this new kind of earth, all the desires for the freedom of the, from the 1950s generation. And yet they could not fully line up with it. No. Whenever a specific generation cannot fully line up with what it is that they have been desiring, that desire must come through in the shape of the next generation. Yeah. So with the indigos, the warriors, we're the ones that are constantly fighting the system. Yeah. We want a new system. So yeah. what comes in next to the new generation is the new system. So would you say like someone's child is sort of like they get born already lined up with your desires? Always. Really? Always. And it is why the, the, a lot of children are the most difficult for their parents. <laughs> yes. Because it's the stuff they don't allow themselves to do. Exactly. But they sort of secretly want it. Exactly. Yeah. It's like the biggest. If, mo if you, I, for those parents out here that are struggling with that kid, yeah, that kid is absolutely everything you want to be. Yeah. That kid is your subconscious. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So we should become more like our kids in a way. Yes. Yeah. This is what what makes me laugh hmm. is that if if a parent is really struggling with their child, take a look at the things that they're struggling with and why they're struggling with those things. If they were to embody more of those things. Yeah. So let's say you've got a kid that's like super rebellious. Look at how your life is so structured. Look at how you resent the fact that it's so structured. You resent the fact that you have to get up and do that every day regardless of whether you yeah. want to or not. If you let yourself not do that, you would have literally half, if not less, of the resistance you have to that child. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good lesson for everyone. <laughs> so um, about like the collective consciousness of humans, um, I, oh, I felt for a really long time that I couldn't really understand why I was feeling so much crap, like, you know, all kinds of different stuff flying around. And then my friend, she, this was when I was younger, she said, well, I feel, I feel almost as if we're like tapped into the collective database and like normal people, they're not. And we are like processing all the stuff that's in this, in the collective subconscious. So do you, do you think that's sort of the way it goes? Like some people process more of, you know, what the debris that's in the collective? Or yeah, I do. Yeah, maybe that's like sort of my job, like I, I in do a way. I do think that job. it's based on certain personality types. I mean, we're all, we are all one species, but we all have different, let's say, roles to play within the full puzzle. So what do you say on my, well, my personality type? <laughs> What's yours? <laughs> I'm just interested. Like, I, I'm a reflector, if you want to know like that. Like a mirror? True. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a mirror within the collective. And so uh, a reflector is essentially doing nothing but showing people what they are over and over and over and over. And you even see that in my job now, thank God. I'm fulfilling that role yeah. on a professional level because it was kind of torment when I was in this capacity and yet participating in different roles in society. It was too hard. Um, I do, you do suck in energy. I've noticed that sitting here even with you today. So you're absorbing a lot of what I'm saying, absorbing a lot of the atmosphere, transmuting a lot of that energy, turning it into something else. So yeah. it's almost like an, an artist that on a subconscious level is taking energy that is not been worked with, regardless of whether it's positive or negative, it's both. You're yeah. absorbing everything 
and then you're, you, it's that energy that you then create with, but it also means that if you're not creating, your life is hell. Yeah, it has been for a really long time. <laughs> it's like I can feel people's pains and like all kinds of stuff, but I always wonder like, is it even beneficial if like, let's say you have an issue or pain or, you know, you feel sad and then I take your sadness, you know, it's hel it helps you in a way, it's loving, but is it really loving? You know what I mean? Like it's a subconscious process. I don't do it on purpose, but I don't know. Like So on a physical dimension, we see things like taking and receiving and yeah. things, but this is not how it works in the higher dimensional field. Mm. In a higher dimensional field, if we were to zoom up, there's no taking or in from anything because we are not two separate beings. Yeah, we're one. So what it looks more like from that higher dimensional perspective is like anything you get into the environment with, you start resonating with very fast. And that instantly will resonate in your body anytime you shift frequency, it does, resonates in your body as a specific emotion. So if I'm vibrating like this, and my emotions feel like that, and then you start vibrating at the same frequency, you instantly can feel how I'm feeling. I am gonna say that that's incredibly beneficial and incredibly loving, because yeah. most of us don't feel seen. Most yeah, of us don't true. feel heard. I mean, that, that capacity to do that, that is the mark of an amazing therapist. It's somebody who can actually vibrate at the same frequency so as to figure out what somebody needs. Yeah. I mean, you have your own perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And it, you're not gonna lose that by virtue of vibrating at my frequency. But if you have your perspective and then you start vibrating at my frequency, you actually have more access to what I might need to do yeah. in order to get out of whatever stuck situation that I'm in. Mm -hmm. So I, I love it. It's just you have to be using it. That's the issue. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it doesn't cause you pain, actually. When you're sitting in a situation like this and you have the capacity to do something with it, it doesn't cause you pain. Mm -hmm. When it causes you pain, when you walk into a cafe with a bunch of people who aren't on this level, you I start know. vibrating at their frequency, and there's nothing you can do about no, it. No, I know I tried. I'm like, you know, but I, I didn't really try that hard because <laughs> I'm a bit, you know, I, I already knew it was going to happen. Like, I shielding and grounding. Like, it's, it helps, of course. It's good, but I sort of know... Well, it's just like this. Let's pretend that you're a parenting expert, right? Yeah. Let's pretend that your life is amazing when you're talking about parenting, when people are receptive to your ideas about parenting, you're in the flow. That mm. feels amazing. It's not a problem to know about parenting at that moment. But how about when you're in the Walmart checkout stand <laughs> and this person just smacked their kid? Oh, yeah, I know. They're going to be in the same amount of pain. Oh, look, we have a visitor. Oh, wow. Oh, I wonder if he lives here. I we should get him in. <laughs> Maybe it's not loud. Oh, it's too bad you guys can't see it. There's really cute cats on the on the balcony outside. You always attract a lot of animals, too. Yeah, yeah I'm just saying. Oh, it's like my <laughs> least favorite thing when I go swimming. I'm a little bit of an ocean mm. phobe. This is a super fun thing because literally this will happen to me everywhere I go, no matter where I am. I'll see bears. If you want to see all these types of animals that most I'll people see never see, come with me. Yeah. But yeah, going swimming in the ocean, it's like. Oh, I'm so. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I can't stand that. I have ocean phobia as well, but not for the ocean itself, but for the animals. Me too. There. But I don't. I'm not scared of the animals, but I am actually afraid of hurting them. This is a weird. Yeah, I don't. Have because that I don't want to touch them or hurt them or uh, that. This is sort of who I am, you know. That's, <laughs> I'm always. That's precious. Concerned. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. But you, you. I thought you loved the ocean, and you. No. Oh. Like, I mean, the ocean in and of itself is amazing. You use you it a lot. You can't, I know, because it's an amazing metaphor. Yeah, that's you can't true. hate the ocean, but oh my God, no. I have like an ocean creature phobia, like bad. Yeah. Oh man. Oh, I'm that person where when I go in and I touch something slimy, I'm like, and you know, yeah. running back to shore. <laughs> yeah, that's too bad for us because the ocean is so healing. The energy of it. Oh, I love it. I, I will it's sit so there at the frequency. ocean all the time. It doesn't prevent me from getting in. But Not true. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think a lot of girls have this. Maybe it's a funny thing. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. So, is there anything you want to share? Like something, some topic you you know? Do you want to say it to anything about your new book or anything about my new book? I'm in love with my new book. Yeah, how's I it going so. with the book? Like, I don't know because I don't pay oh. attention. Mm. I've got a publisher that basically tells me how it's doing quarterly and I don't ever see mm. the reports because I'm too busy creating. So yeah, okay. Well, I have no idea how my book is doing. I really want it to do better than ever, you know, yeah. but I, I, the, the reality is, is I just, when you're so passionate about something, it doesn't really matter. No, true. I know what you mean. So yeah, I'm taking it all over the planet. I mean, that's part of why I'm here in Europe right now is I'm doing a big training out in Glastonbury, England right after this. Yeah. 
England needs this process so bad, I can't tell you. So yeah. I'm basically going out there for a five-day training mm -hmm. where I'm teaching people. Completion process. Yeah, I'm obsessed. Yeah. It's what I use to heal myself. I'm literally, obsessed is an understatement. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's, a, what's a better word for obsessed? Like, I don't know. Yeah, but I'm totally dedicated. To yeah, life. I understand. Of course. Just, it's so healing when you start feeling your emotions. It's like such a relief. Stuff you've been walking around with for 15 years, always bugging you somehow in the background or, you know, it's like you, you just feel through it, you just allow it and it could be gone in like two minutes even. That's what I tell my clients as well. People always, they, they get really scared of, you know, allowing their emotions because they don't know what's there, how long, they, they're afraid they're gonna get swallowed by it and never be able to get out of it. But it's really not like that. Mm -hmm. Your system is so grateful to you, You're like your oh, whole yeah. body, all your cells, all your, you know, either personality parts or soul fragments, however you want to call it. It's like, it's like the whole universe, like <laughs> bowing and clapping when you finally allow it to happen. Yeah. Such a relief. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, yeah, it's a good process. And you also gave these books, uh, was it uh, like in, to prisoners? Oh yeah. Oh, I, this is a whole project that I, I'm not done with it. I'm, this is going to just get bigger and bigger and bigger, but we've got this prison project. So yeah. because I want, I want this to be used on demographics like that. Why do you think people end up in prison? Oh, because they wanted it. Yeah. At five years old, you've got a person who's like, you know, I know how I want to spend the rest of my life is in prison. No, these people are there because of trauma and yet we put them there and traumatize them worse. Oh my God. Yeah. So basically when I started thinking about the perfect place to institute these types of internal changes and the perfect place, obviously, because they have nothing else to do. Yeah, they have time. I was like, I want it there. So, so I'm this prison project, we take these books and we send them to prisons all over. Right now it's all over the US. I want it to be eventually all over the world so that when people are sitting there in their jail cells, they actually have this kind of processing yeah. to do. We know that meditation is working amazingly in jails. This is not new news. And that's just meditation. Imagine processing, like deep internal journey processing, which enables people to mm -hmm. heal the wounds that caused them to even be in there in the first place. And you have the capacity to do that while people are in jail. It is just such a passion of mine. So yeah, that's our prison project. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's so wonderful you even send the books there. Like, you know, it's like, I don't know, it touched my heart. It's like, yeah, it's great. I feel like, you know, maybe we should write the Dutch government a letter and say, like, you know, order some books, man. Get a, get with the program. Yeah. We're just now starting to see some letters from some of those books. Oh, yeah? Yeah. They're coming in. Well, because in the U.S., I don't know how it works up here, but in the U.S., they, they're allowed to write letters on occasion. Yeah, yeah. If they have certain privileges, they yeah. can write letters out. And so we just got one or two letters from people who have been reading the books in prison saying, you know, I had no idea that, that this was linked to that. And I just, it's um, the kind of letter where you read it and you're like, oh my God, yeah. it's working, you know? I can imagine. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. because we, I, what I love about it too is that without them even having to do anything, any of the people that work at these, these places, without them having to do anything, you're actually giving people the resource, which is what awareness is, to be able to start back on the same foot again. Because the worst thing you can do for somebody, which is what we actually do, which is to throw somebody in jail and remind them of how bad they are over and over yeah. every single day. And then we expect that when we open the jail bars after <laughs> their sentence is done, that they're gonna come out with that newfound belief, which really isn't new. That's why they're in there in the first place. You can find a lot better people in jail than out of jail, just so you know, because of the level of guilt. Yeah. But <clears throat> we open the jail bars and we expect that they can just exist in society with this concept that they're so bad. It's not going to happen. They're going to end up back in jail in three and a half seconds. So if you can offer this type of a, a healing capacity to them so that they can start working on the fact that they may not actually be true, it may actually be the result of something they experienced when they were younger, mm -hmm. now you've challenged the belief that's causing them to perpetrate in the first place. Yeah. Well, it's the whole punishment system that's like in parenting, in workplace. It's Yeah, I know, it's everywhere. <laughs> But it's like, I guess we should have some compassion and know like the people, whenever this, this system sort of started, it's like ages ago, right? Punishment and reward was an improvement in the 1600s. Yeah. Yeah. End of story. Yeah. <laughs>
they, they didn't know what to do. So I guess for, you know, the, the mind would be like, okay, you know, we got to set some boundaries here. So I get it. But for a lot of people, it's like a super strange concept that you, if you love someone who did something wrong, you can cure them and heal them and, you know, love them back into, you know, doing whatever it is is more beneficial. But yeah, I, th I thought there was like some tribes in Africa who do this. There's like this, yep. this, this image on the internet saying if someone, you know. No, it's actually true. So like a lot of sociologists around the world, I don't know, of course I'm going to space the name, but there's an a isolated community. It's on an island, if I believe it, mm. if I'm remembering it right. But the but sociologists have been studying them because their crime rate is so low, so yeah. low literally that for all sociologists around the world, it's like, how do you explain this? And their way of dealing with um, people who perpetrate is to sit them in the middle of a circle yes. and the entire tribe fasts. And for three days, they sit in a circle around them, shouting at them things that they love about them. It's yes. literally like a trance. You watch them go back and forth like this, where they just are yelling at this person all the things they love about them. And what do we find? No crime. Big surprise, right? For those of us that understand the way vibration works, not a surprise. Yeah. But for people who are locked into the punishment reward-based system, super surprise. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was amazing. I think that, that it, there's an image of that going around the internet and it's, it's really, I hope it touches a lot of people's hearts, you know, saying, you know, because if someone makes a mistake, it's because they're hurting, they're in pain. What do you do? You know, you don't punish them out of pain. So, yeah. Punishing people into wellness is not a possibility. No. No, even on a logical level, if you, if you suggest that concept to somebody, you cannot punish someone into wellness. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Yeah, it does. But we have to separate between goodness and wellness. Yeah. You can make somebody be good by society standards, but that does not necessarily mean they're well. No, no, definitely. You <laughs> should the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so and a well you... person doesn't perpetrate. So. No, that's true. If you're happy, you don't feel the need to hurt others or, you know, mm -hmm. back steal and lie. Right. So, any other projects we should know about? Th or things you wish you could do in the future? Like. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, the list will uh, start The list is now. so long. I want to create alternatives to jails. So this is, I mean, we're on the yeah. subject already. That is my, my opus, mm -hmm. eventually, is going to be to create an alternative to the jail system. And it's going to start with satellite programs. So to start with is how it works in the United States. You, you get a facility, and then you get the government to approve a certain amount of people, maybe 15 prisoners at best. Hmm. And it's this brand new program, right? So they enroll in there and everything in this place is going to be dedicated towards wellness, yeah. towards emotional healing, zero punishment system, giving them skills for being back on the street. Yeah. And so when we put people into here, of course, to begin with, most of society is not going to know how that's going to go. I know how it's going to go because I understand vibration. Yeah. I've also got tons of people that are already completely ready to do it. I mean, when I started speaking and talking, people started contacting me from all over the place who were already working in that capacity, mm. counselors in jails, yeah, yeah. and they were like, look, the minute you start this, I'm quitting my job, I'm working for you. So I've already got that whole system set up. It's about coming up with the funds and the ways to actually create that first satellite program and also getting the government to approve it is going to be the hardest part. I'm not I retarded. Know. Yeah. I know that this is big business, so what I'm up against is people being like, no, we're making money on prisoners. Why the hell would we want you to actually solve this problem? Yeah. So yeah. I know that I'm up against that, but I ho hopefully, basically, my fame will grow. This is what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that my fame grows and grows and grows and grows to the point where when I put pressure on the American government, that all the media is going to cover, cover it. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, the reality is, is like, I mean, this part of me coming over here to, to Europe and things like that, it's re America's very competitive. So if you can get one of these European countries to try something like that, yeah, true. and then I can, as a, as a very famous spiritual figure, basically be like, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you doing it? Look at they're not doing it. Oh, look, do you see they make money off of this? So basically, <laughs> they put them in a position where like, you know, so they mm -hmm. eventually have to let you do it. Yeah. And the reality is, is we already know what the outcome's going to be. Yeah. So once the outcome is good, you basically force the old system to become this new system. This is the new way of, of treating perpetrators. Yeah. But do you think it's not easier, like, not to change the old system, but make create a new system, like lose from the government? Probably. Uh, I would love if, that. If it but the government's possible. not going anywhere yet. If it, no, I'll, I'll I be understand. the happiest person. <clears throat> if the whole damn system collapses, then we're fine already. So yeah. there's no, I mean, there's no point in even having this conversation. But I'm making sort of a A B C plan. Yeah. A plan for if the government's still in place for X, Y, and Z years, hmm. and a plan for if it completely implodes. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Uh, I mean, if it implodes, we're fine. Because the reality is, like, we're not going to be able to build that same system. No, no one would, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's oh, that brings me to another question. Well, it's sort of like a statement, maybe, but the future. I know we, you talked about this yesterday. A lot of people are always on this, you know, what's going to happen? Is the system going to collapse? Uh, <laughs> what, what, that's another question I want to ask. Like, there's these waves coming in. That's how it feels. Is it like an influx of light or love or high frequency? Because I feel, especially the last few months, so many people freaking out like even the most stable people are starting to show cracks and emotions and you ever issues. seen somebody have a baby no <laughs> i haven't it would be fun for you to watch these are contractions yeah <laughs> yeah i get it okay. so ultimately it, i mean it's both sides of the coin does it suck oh yeah like these waves that are coming in are not actually been like awesome. No, they're not. <laughs> and then they come with terrorist attacks and they come with all of these types of symptoms. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we're giving birth to a new society. We're giving birth to the, the next step in the human race. Yeah. So how would you describe it as if like, it, it feels for me as if something is pushing out all the emotion, all the negative vibration, darkness. I don't know how to, it's like a cleansing or oh, yeah. I don't know how to. Well, part of what you're feeling is the earth itself. Yeah. <clears throat> when the universe shifts in frequency, because everything has to be by virtue of law of attraction, there is nothing that is exempt from that in this particular time-space reality. Yeah. So if the universe shifts in frequency, the earth itself has to shift in frequency, and everything that's a match to the earth has to shift in frequency. Mm -hmm. So you're watching even the shift within Gaia, this yeah. being that we live on, that we call earth, yeah. has made a shift. So it's a bit like also like a spiritual flu. It's exactly it gets that. rid of all the old crap. Oh, it's exactly that. And I think it's pretty interesting for people that like direct metaphors. Yeah. You can literally look at what's happening on the planet Earth exactly like that. So what happens when a human being gets the flu? They start to get a fever. That's global warming. They start yeah. to get uh, chills. That's earthquakes. They start to get the sweats. That's flooding, you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Earth is going through this exact same process. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I, I feel in my heart, of course, that it's a good process and, you know, I know where we're going and just stick in there, you know, hang in there. But, yeah, I think for a lot of people who have no clue about anything, they feel like, why am I just falling apart and freaking out? You're and falling apart because do? this is birth. What can they do? What can people at home do that are suffering from the awakening symptoms or however you want to call it? You learn to allow. Yeah, just allow whatever is happening. When, when a woman has a baby, the worst thing that she can possibly do is to resist the process that's going on within her own body. Yeah. And she's, she's got to basically yeah. let it happen. If she tries to tense against it and tries to gain control back, whoa, oh, is that ever a torture. I know. So it's basically about, this is the time period in life where you have to completely allow the chaos. You have got to allow it to occur and stay completely focused on whatever it is that you genuinely want. Yeah, that's important too, I feel. People get really sidetracked or lost or focused on, that's, I think it's a human mind thing. You know, if there's a fire over there, it's really hard for me to focus, you know, oh, on yeah. wherever I want to go. So, but I think that's, that was my other question. What can we do? Because I really strongly still believe that we can still bend the future and, you know, many things that we are lining up with right now it doesn't have to be that way we can have this change without maybe that many casualties you know what i mean so would you agree that i'm never going to say that something's impossible yeah because i understand the capacity of human creation except for i also understand momentum yeah there is all already a lot of <laughs> there's been momentum for this particular shift since before yeah nostradamus mm. The reason that so many of the great prophets of our race have been able to perceive what's going to happen right here now is because it has been in the path of momentum mm -hmm. for thousands of years. So when it, if you're going to ask me as an, let's just call me an expert in the field of predicting humanity. Yeah. I do not predict that we're going to be able to slow down that momentum. I well, believe what, that we're, what momentum are we talking about? Like the, the, the change, the shift, the new way, the new world? I'm all for this, okay. but I'm more talking about the so way that it's... Let's just pretend that a, a human being is lining up with cancer. Yeah. But that momentum was started when they were six years old, when they lost their father. Mm -hmm. And so let's look at this. This is 
30 something years of them thinking a certain way as a result of that, went, that event, being a certain way as a result of that event, that is momentum. That is a serious amount of vibrational momentum. Yeah. Now, if a person had an awakening, yeah. they could completely redirect that momentum. But what I am doing here is looking at a cross-section of the world, not just of people like you and I who are awake. Now, granted, that's the majority of who I interact with in this, this line of work. But also, you know, being down here just in the center of the town. Yeah. I'm looking at, on an average street, 300-something people who are not awake. Yeah. That is by far the majority. Yeah, that that's is the momentum. true. It's going to be hard to bend this. The momentum <laughs> of, the, of the general demographic right now on this planet is headed towards World War III. That's the cancer. And yeah. I, I do not see a single life path where Without. we avoid it. It doesn't. It's not to say that it is impossible. I'm not going to say that it's impossible. But if I'm going to make a bet, there's no way I'm putting money on us avoiding it. Well, it's just I feel like people don't know what to do, you know. So if, if we could somehow spread the word and say, okay, look, man, you should want better things for yourself and for this earth, you know. Well, can, can you, you express your needs? Do need? you have the capacity to get control of the media? Not really. Well, if, this if, is sort of media. But. If you want to change the way that people think on this planet, we're talking the, dem the general demographic, not the people who are already awake. If you want to change yeah, those people, yeah. you've got to get control of the media. So if there's anybody watching who has control of the mainstream media, oh, this is friend. the way <laughs> to do it. <laughs> yeah, I know. But what you and people like you and I have to be you know, a little bit honest about the fact that the people who are watching these types of programs, they're already waking up. Yeah. They're on board with us. <laughs> They're not the ones who are creating the momentum that will no. lead up with the Third World War. Which is why now, because, I mean, it changed. For, for a good period of my career, up to 2012 was this apex where in the life path potentials, there was still a potential for us to swing. After 2012, there was none of that. All of the life path potentials for the human race was a match to this Third World War and a major collapse of the current system. Mm -hmm. So... I had a decision to make, as it, and this is a very serious decision. In a position like mine, it is one of the most serious decisions you have to make. Yeah. Am I going to educate people only towards, oh, we can change everything and everything's going to be wonderful, or do I give them a tiny bit of preparation, like you might a woman in labor? Look, this could really hurt. Yeah. And if it starts really, really hurting, this, this is, is what, what to do, do about it. Yeah. So I basically made that decision. Based off of what I'm seeing, I think it's much more important to prepare people who, you know, that what they're looking at here on planet Earth isn't going to be sunshine, gums, rubs, and roses. Mm -hmm. And what they need to do about it is fill in the blank. Yeah, and that's what, what you say, uh, I think it was in another interview, and you said it yesterday, well, what we can do uh, in how to deal with it is just to follow what feels good for us as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I, you're called, I mean, most of us who are awake already are basically called to create a new system already, and it's what we've been wanting. Yeah. I'm sort of laughing at this, right? Because right now we've got a presidential election, like, currently going on that's a, you know, let's say a, um, a world travesty. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got this election going on in the United States, and I'm, I'm, people are literally over there just going, like, I don't understand what is going on right now. Like, how is this possible? But from, from somebody who understands the way that collective asking works, it's exactly what everyone's been asking for. Now, we've got one presidential candidate over there who is going to demolish the system and one who would uphold the old system. Mm. And what I'm watching is even in the demographic that's like super, super young, most of them are in support of the guy who's, I mean, the opposite of who you would expect <laughs> any liberal to ever vote for, ever, I'm... is the more compelling candidate. Why? Because we have secretly wanted a demolishment of the system because it's destroying us. Yeah. So like we're almost in a position where if you're actually honest with yourself, not this temporal self that doesn't want to die in a war, if you're really honest with what you genuinely want, most of us are like, yeah, we don't want this anymore. Like we don't want the imprisonment of the, the work week. We don't want this, this. Of course you want a destruction. So are you going to line up with a president who's going to save everything or one who's going to destroy everything? <laughs> so, I, yeah, I'm all for the destruction of the old system. I'm like just the war thing, sort of. Me know. too, but I'm, but I just, I just, I agree with you. Yeah. But I, I also, it's like, so what do you think is going to look like? The destruction of the old system. What is that going to yeah, look like? Yeah, I know it's very abstract. Like, what's going to happen? I don't know. What other way it should have been done? <laughs> I don't know. I've never really thought about it. It's crazy how people can desire something, but never really think about how or, you know, put any effort into the, you know, people, many people are like, oh, fuck the system, I don't want this, you know, but then 
they don't know how well they don't understand do the practicality one. yeah you ha if you have not created something already this is why this is why we're getting into this mess because we haven't created something already meaning these sustainable communities where we've got yeah. permaculture and things like this mm. what does it look like if you say fuck the system and the system collapses it looks like suddenly my grocery store has no food I know. suddenly there's no import yeah. suddenly there's border protection suddenly people are getting shot suddenly the people who are afraid have all got weapons so this is what it looks like yeah so we are not being honest with ourselves about what it looks like for the human ego to be challenged no. and to change <laughs> oh my god i'm already thinking where should i hide where am i going to go some cave somewhere see now this is the thing like, the middle earth some people will tell you don't focus on it like just don't focus on it because you're going to create it right no, but I think it's good to sort of do focus on it. And yeah, that's my thing. It, like, make I, a plan. We're at a point right now where yeah. that's the decision I had to make as a spiritual teacher. Like, I am now at a point where I am telling people, no, you really do need to have a plan. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Some homework for tonight, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and that plan shouldn't be, oh, me hiding in my house. Because that's not what you want. See, the plan shouldn't be what you don't want. No, The, we the plan should be what yeah. do you want. So, I mean, a lot of people who are in this demographic who are awakening, we already know we, that we want sustainable communities. So where in the world is that going to be? Yeah. Then go there. Yeah. Start setting it up. Start bringing your friends. This is the kind of stuff we need to start doing right now. Yeah, and, and organizing, like getting together, yeah. uni unify. It's better now than, than when, yeah, when crap hits the fan. I mean, this is, I've sort of been joking about this. It's not really funny, but it's in, when World War II started to go down, mm. right? We saw the same kind of stacking within governments as we're seeing right now, actually. When World War II went down, there was a lot of people who were in Germany who thought that the people who were exiting, the mass exodus, were nuts. They yeah. were like, what the hell are you doing? No. Five years later, were they crazy? Yeah. Yeah. They had a good intuition. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, should we just think of something more positive, to anything to end this with? Or is there anything you want to say? Just so we can, well, I think it's good to talk about all this stuff, of course, but <laughs> I could feel the whole collective vibe go, you know, <laughs> it's like, oh. Um, well, the whole collective vibe sort of goes like that because most people haven't jumped ship yet, so. Yeah. I mean, that's the reality when you're sort of stuck here and you don't have any kind of number two plan, that's what happens. But the what I notice is that the people who actually do start doing that where they're like you know i do actually have a plan for where i'm going and where i want to create all this kind of stuff it, it doesn't create the same kind of terror so oh true that will change yeah positively <laughs> on a much more positive note hmm. i don't know I, I i'm just not the kind of teacher that really feels the necessity to immediately escape out of negative into a positive feeling so no i'm sorry maybe that's just me then <laughs> i just yeah well, in general, when you, I mean, it's understandable, but in general, when you meet somebody and they're, and what they have to say is, you know, I just, I really have to believe that we're capable of not lining up with that. It's a resistance to lining up with that. Yeah, it is. Of course. I am this person. <laughs> I'm a resistant person to anything. I, I have such a strong will and st strong and like and dislike. I'm like, no, we have to go this way. I get it. Like, I know, you know, it's better to, to be more allowing and, of course, you know, find a good way to handle it, and I will, but <laughs> I just, I always have a lot of hope inside me, so I'm like hanging on for dear life, like, yeah, we can still change it. I just, I don't want any, you know, death and people, innocent victims, that's more like my thing. Oh, I don't need, I mean, trust me, you can't find it being an earth that hates suffering more than me. I'm the person that will spend like a yeah. good hour trying to get a spider out of my house. Ah, I'm the same. So, like, you know. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So you, so how can you be okay with death? Oh, I don't have a problem with death, per But se. you just said you didn't want well, death and destruction. Well, not my death, but other people, like, I, okay, so I don't So why know. is death not okay for other people? I don't know, like, I, to me it feels like there's this feeling inside me that says we could have done this a better way, like a different way, that if we could have all, all the people, even the ones that died, could have enjoyed the new earth or something, you know, like, it feels so... I don't know. So it's wrong to not enjoy the new earth. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it feels like a shame for them to die. I don't know why. Maybe innocent people dying for me is a real, I don't know. 
some of it is that you're projecting your wanting over theirs. Yeah. Yeah, true. Maybe they don't even want to be a part of it. <laughs> Maybe they want to die. Well, technically, if you, you know, look at the whole manifestation vibration thing, you po technically could not die if it wasn't in There your is no such thing as, as a death that is not suicide. Not yeah, one. exactly. A part of you actually does want to die. Yes, yeah, like in the moment of death, if you, let's say you line up with a physical accident. Yeah. You're, there must be an agreement between the two perspectives. Otherwise, you're in a coma. That's what a coma is. Yeah, a coma yeah. is we can't agree. We're still for, figuring it out, it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So basically, the reason we say there is no death that is not a suicide is because there has to be the mutual agreement that death provides more expansion currently yeah. than life. Yeah. Now, I know that a lot of us in this, in this awakening community have gotten ourselves into positions where we're dealing with some sort of an emotional trauma, right? Yeah. And the emotional trauma is so incredibly intense for us that we have that moment where we're like, oh my God, like it would just be easier to reset. Yeah, it's I've had it <laughs> many times. I'm yeah. sure you have. All of us have had that many times. Yeah. So, so if you have been in that situation even once where you've run into that issue where it feels like you're trying to untie a fishing knot that there's no yeah. way in hell it's going to get untied, think about what it would be like for the average person in society yeah, to wake right. up. you're so right. There will be a great many people who are going to choose yeah. to exit. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's what they've been writing in all these blogs for years, like the, about the whole shift, you know. So many people will not be able to sustain the new anything, new frequency, new system. They will just not be a match because they don't want to be or they can't. So I guess I shouldn't feel bad about, you know. That. No, you, you can't feel bad about it. I'm just a very compassionate person. Me too. I am too. <laughs> yeah, what no. it is is that you shouldn't. You should you get away from shouldn't. That's all. Yeah. So I shouldn't feel bad. Start to address your issue with shouldn't. Mm. Because maybe you should. I mean, you feel bad, so you should. That's the reality. Yeah. Same thing though when it comes to death. They shouldn't die. Address the should. So, I mean, if there's something that people can do for themselves, it's to question the shoulds mm. and should nots. Yeah, people have many of those. Oh. Like hundreds, thousands, maybe, yeah. in their own brain. Yeah. yeah. Come, becomes like a maze or like labyrinth yeah and it's i mean it's fine to, I, to make changes is awesome when you should really confront your shoulds is when you're up against something and it's not really going to change you know when it's yeah. like oh they shouldn't have died well good luck bringing them back yeah, when you're in that type of situation the way to work around that emotionally is to deal with your own shoulds yeah <laughs> and the why why yeah i got it. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, acceptance is not really my thing. <laughs> it, yeah, honestly, it's not my forte either, I have to be honest. Maybe that's the indigo DNA oh, as it well. Is. No, it, it is. It goes straightly against everything I am. It's like, no, I will not accept. Well, that's because you are meant to be changing the system. So, yeah. of course, if you were like, oh, I guess it should be this way, then you wouldn't be changing no, the system. No, so. yeah, it wouldn't be very effective at my job. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, DNA. So wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think we pretty much covered everything. So I wish you um, a wonderful stay. I think you're still here for one day or something, yeah. maybe. And I can just have some free time. And I guess I get to explore more of the city before I write my blog, Demolishing Everything. Oh, no, yeah, <laughs> you're going to write the energy report or what, what yes, do you call it? Like every a, city that I go to, I write an energetic diagnosis on the general populace of the place that I go to. And I love it, it's my favorite thing, and a lot of the people that follow me love it, but it's kind of like, I'm sort of like a, an energy doctor that's going in and saying, this is the dominant positive aspect of this place, of this city, this is the dominant negative aspect of this place, of this city. And so it's really funny to watch the reactions. Some people are like, oh my god, this is so yes, and other people are like, ah, and they get so like upset and threatened by it. But oh, really? Because it's so real and true? Well, it depends how identified you are. Yeah. Some people are really identified with where they live. Other people are not super identified with where they live. So if you're not really identified, you can see something objectively. But if you're super identified with where you live, it come, these energy diagnoses that I do come off as like yeah. personal attack. I know. Where I'm like, this is your issue. And everyone's like, that is not my issue. That's <laughs> not fair. I love my city. I found this place over here that's not that way. So, yeah. But you do write about it positive as yeah. well. So that's good. I mean, that should, you know, <laughs> sort of, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm really curious to see. When are you going to post it? Tomorrow or something? Yeah, it should probably be tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, I'll right. write it on the airplane. Yeah. Okay. Well, 
And I wish you a lot of uh, good luck with the training of the uh, practitioners, right? Yes. And, uh, New workshop in Dublin. People can still buy tickets or not? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Fly to Dublin, go see Teal, buy our new book, completion <laughs> process. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank this you. interview. <laughs>